Welcome everyone to episode 50 of Ohio Unsolved. I'm your host Matthew, and this is the second Halloween special for this month. This is also the last episode before my week off. We'll be back on November 11th with a brand new episode. But enough with that, let's just get right into the episode. Everyone sit back, make sure to lock your doors and windows, and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. Our first story takes us to Long Island, and it is a little graphic. Listener discretion is advised. On Halloween 2014, the residents of a Long Island community would witness a man dragging a headless body into the street. Their initial thoughts were that someone was setting up their Halloween display or playing a prank, but upon closer inspection, they discovered that it was no prank. Patricia Ward was a 66-year-old professor from Long Island who lived at home with her 35-year-old son, Derek Ward. Patricia taught language arts in a program that prepares high school students for college, and she worked there for 28 years. She was very well-known, well-liked, and well-respected among the campus and students. For years, Derek had suffered with mental health problems, which went back 10 years. His psychiatric problems began to get worse soon after the death of his grandfather in August of 2013. Derek also had quite a lengthy criminal record. He was unemployed, and he had an arrest record which dated back more than 10 years. He had served time on drugs and weapon charges, and he had been on probation for a while. In 2006, he was found in the possession of a 9mm handgun and 100 Valium. According to the neighbors, Patricia and Derek both seemed like any regular mother and son. There were never any arguments that the neighbors could hear, nor were there any record of domestic violence complaints. Some did notice that Derek was always with his mother. One neighbor said, I did notice that it did seem that she was very protective, making sure he had certain things. I did hear hear her ask, do you have your wallet? Patricia truly adored her son and did everything in her power to help him battle his psychiatric problems. On the day before Halloween of 2014, when neighbors of the Ward family witnessed Derek dragging a decapitated body from the apartment that he shared with his mother. He then kicked the decapitated head across the street before walking off. Since it was so close to Halloween, the witness simply thought that it was nothing more than a prank or even a grim decoration. The body was near a home that was decorated with pumpkins, cobwebs, and a fake graveyard, so it didn't look too out of place. Dale Silverman, who lived nearby, later drove past. She described the scene. I saw what I thought was a head in the street. I saw long, black hair and the head face down. She described how the body was completely straight out with the legs together and the hands at the side. It looked fake. I thought it was a stupid Halloween prank. When somebody finally went to inspect a body, They recoiled in horror when they discovered that it wasn't a Halloween prank at all. Derek had dragged a decapitated body of his own mother into the street 
and then kicked her head down the street. It wouldn't take long before it was uncovered what happened to Derek afterwards. After killing his mother, he had walked around a mile away from his home and he jumped in front of a Long Island Railroad train. He was struck and killed by an eastbound train near the Farmingdale station. His suicide would quickly be linked with the murder of Patricia. According to the police, Derek had stabbed his mother to death, beheaded her, and then sat in the blood-spattered apartment for several minutes before dragging Patricia's mutilated body down the stairs and into the street. As news of the grim murder swept throughout the area, Detective Lieutenant John Azada said, It appears that this was a murder-suicide. It was determined that Patricia had suffered multiple stab wounds and broken ribs. Inside the apartment, police found the murder weapon, a knife. Tributes for Patricia would come flooding in. We are in shock, said Patrick Colbera, Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Farmingdale State College. The staff in her department is teary-eyed. We are providing counseling to the whole staff, anyone who needs it. It's a very sad day. A lot of people are taking it very hard. In the wake of the murder-suicide, it would be uncovered that Derek had not been taking medication and had been scheduled to see a psychiatrist. According to his uncle, Reverend Robert Lubrano, Derek had not had medication for around four days when he killed his mother. He stated, she's dead because he had a mental illness and we didn't know how serious it was. We were in terrible shock. She was a wonderful person and he was a sick, sick kid. According to his uncle, Derek had never been violent towards his mother and he blamed the murder-suicide on lack of access to psychiatric help. He said that Patricia was in the process of getting her son the help that he needed and an appointment was scheduled with a psychiatrist for two days after her murder. Patricia struggled to find a psychiatrist for her son. Derek was too old to be covered by her insurance, and she had difficulties finding a psychiatrist that would accept Medicaid. When she finally did find one, she was paying $200 for a 20-minute visit. Patricia worried more than anything that her son would take his own life. Their family said that in the lead up to the murder-suicide, Derek had become increasingly unstable and that they tried to encourage Patricia to call the police, but she refused. She feared that the police would lock her son away. While Derek had problems, he had never been diagnosed with any specific mental disorder. He heard voices in his head and his family speculated that he had schizophrenia. As his uncle said, he was a really good kid. Whatever happened after my father died, it broke him. I don't even know what to say about this story. Killing your mother and then taking your own life definitely screams of mental health troubles. I just wish that the remaining family was able to get through this horrific ordeal. I know from experience uh, just how troubling mental health can be. So just know that there's always somebody out there willing to listen. Our next story comes from yourghoststories.com. As always, I'll be reading from the author's perspective. My family became friends with another family due to a mutual friend, and we started hanging out with them occasionally because my brother was eight and their daughter was nine. This was probably about three years ago. I was 16 at the time. The first time that I met their daughter, I thought she she was way older than she really was because she was very tall and a heavy built child. This family threw a Halloween themed get together And even though I told my mom a thousand times that I really, really did not want to go, and she knew events with people made me anxious, I was forced to go with with them. 
This was the first time that I went to their house. As soon as I got there, I felt sick, uneasy, scared even. I figured the people were making me nervous, and what I was feeling was just me building up to an anxiety attack. But no matter how many times I was asked, I refused to go upstairs where my brother was, and where there was less people. I was actually afraid to. I didn't know why, because normally that's where what I would have done to calm myself. I will often flee populated areas that give me anxiety, and my brother is special to me and he makes me feel better. Unfortunately, he didn't want to join me downstairs. If I wasn't with the kids, then I was with most of the fairly intoxicated adults outside, or I was just sitting by myself in a corner of the living room. I chose to sit by myself. The whole time, I wanted to leave. I just did not feel good. I wanted out of that house so badly. I never wanted to leave a place more in my life. I was shaking. I wasn't even around that many people, let alone conversing with any. So why was I acting this way? I was feeling tons more anxiety than ever. Luckily, at around 10 p.m., I was able to have a friend come rescue me. She picked me up and I stayed the night with her. What's interesting is what occurred later that night after I had left. My mom told me that she came inside to use the bathroom but she heard yelling and something going on upstairs. And when she ran to check it out, she found their daughter running after my little brother, swinging a bowling pin at him. She was purposely trying to hurt him. She actually did hit him once on the arm and left a pretty nasty bruise. My mom said that when she walked in, the girl was filled with rage. Of course, after confronting the family, she was really upset and left and didn't want to see them again, considering she could have really injured him or even killed him had she hit him on the head with enough force. He was really lucky that she happened to come inside and hear the noise upstairs when she did. He said that he doesn't know why she got so mad, but that she started acting freaky, and it all happened very, very quickly. About a week later, my mom was visiting with our mutual friend that introduced us to them. They weren't able to come to the get-together. The topic came up about what had happened and why we chose not to associate with them anymore. She said that that's creepy because they've actually recently confided in her and shared that they've been dealing with something in their house that's traumatizing them. They had been seeing a shadow peering out of bedrooms, jumping out at them, and scaring them half to death on a daily basis. She even said that they got pictures of it. The mother had her phone with her and was in the bathroom with the door open. When this thing started flying back and forth in the bedroom, terrifying her. I wish that I had gotten the chance to see this picture. When I heard this, I was really shocked because everything that I was feeling made sense. It explains why I was so scared especially by the thought of going upstairs. I knew I was way more upset and uncomfortable in that house than necessary. I must have been sensing whatever this negative presence was, and it seems like maybe it was affecting this little girl too. Our last story also comes from yourghoststories.com. This story begins when I was a child, probably about seven years old. My mom and aunts threw a huge Halloween party for all the kids in the family. I think there were 16 of us at the time, ranging in age from probably five to 13. It was awesome, but the coolest part came about the time it just got really dark. We took a hay ride to a cemetery a few miles down the road from my aunt and uncles where the party was being held. My mom told us about some of the people buried there and how some of them were not resting in peace. Typical urban legend stuff. When we got there, the adults said that they wanted to show us the grave of an old man whose ghost was seeking revenge for his wrongful death. We were all scared and excited, creeping through the cemetery in the dark towards the largest tombstone. When we were about halfway there, 
my dad and uncles popped up from behind the graves wearing scary masks. The kids all screamed and ran for the wagon while the ghosts and moms all laughed. For years, the adults retold this story, laughing over the details of our panicked faces and terrified attempts to get away. When I was a teenager, my sister and two of my cousins decided to get our moms back for this prank. Our parents got together once a month to play cards. So that October, we made sure that we were around for card night. We waited until our fathers went out for a beer run which inevitably meant an hour or two at the local bar. We told our moms about a legend that we had heard about a sad ghost that could be seen weeping at her husband's grave when the moonlight hit it. We had made this story up, and we convinced them to take us to see it. My cousin secretly called his best friend, who had agreed to go there in a mask and hide to scare them. The prank worked perfectly, and our mothers nearly peed themselves. We all laughed as we went back to our car. When we got to the car, it wouldn't start. We laughed some more about the ghost sabotaging it, and we decided to walk to where my cousin's friend had hidden his car. We would send our dads to get the car later, but of course, his car wouldn't start either. We started to feel a little weird about this, since neither car had had problems recently. But what could we do? This was before everyone had cell phones, so we started walking towards the closest house, which was about a mile or two away. Though none of us knew them well, we knew the family name and the people who lived there. As we walked up their long driveway, we started to worry, because there was no cars parked by the house and it looked pretty dark inside. We knocked anyway, but got no answer. We were about to leave, not having nearly as much fun thinking we would have to walk the long distance to the next house, when we heard voices coming from the back of the house. We went to the backyard looking for the people that we had heard, but it was pretty dark and nobody was around. We yelled, hello, a few times and identified ourselves, but got no answer. The backyard had a fair amount of trees, and suddenly large branches started falling. This scared us since there was no apparent cause. In just a few seconds, at least a dozen branches bigger than our arms fell from the five or six trees closest to us. We all ran. When we were around the end of the driveway, my cousin screamed and pointed toward the house. It looked like several pairs of red eyes were peering around the house at us. We ran straight back to our car and tried it again. It started with no problem. We did not stop at my cousin's friend's car and we went right back to the house. Later that night, my uncle and dad and cousin took his friend back and picked up his car, which also started on the first try. When they drove past the house, it looked completely normal and there was a car in the driveway. We have never been sure if the people there saw us murking about in the graveyard and decided to prank the pranksters, or if it was something else. If it was a prank, they put it together awfully fast and never laughingly confessed. We felt too foolish to ask. Well, that's going to do it for our last Halloween special this month. I hope everyone enjoyed the stories, and if you did, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, don't forget to join us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube. I promise that I'll get back to uploading the episodes there just as soon as I can. If you do enjoy this podcast please consider helping to support the show by subscribing on Patreon with monthly bonus episodes starting at the $5 tier. Once again, thank you everyone, and make sure to keep your doors and windows locked, and stay ready for Ohio Unsolved. <laughs>